and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again, and we're heading back to Marvel Transformers. Or rather, the Marvel UK stuff. As a reminder for what these are, while the American comics came out monthly, the Transformers comic in the UK came out weekly, as was tradition for children's comics there. However, obviously they didn't really have enough material from the American comics to really do that, so the creators at Marvel UK produced extra material, backup stories, or stories that happened in between the larger ones occurring in the American stories. This occasionally led to continuity contradictions they had to clean up, a notable example being Megatron encountering the Predacons combiner team before before he did in the American comic, and then needing amnesia to forget that he had done so when they caught up to it. But it also led to a bunch of extra memorable storylines in their own right, like the story where Starscream learns the true meaning of Christmas. When I did my Marvel Transformers retrospective two years ago, a lot of people were upset that I was only covering the American stuff because the UK stuff was so good, but like... People, you see how long the retrospectives are already, right? We'd still probably be talking about them at this point if I had done the UK issues too. Anyway, since the UK stuff had room to expand on other characters not focused on in the American book, the patron asked me to look at a story featuring not only more on Hot Rod, but the character that ties together so many crossovers simply because rights issues are bullcrap. Death's Head. Much like Circuit Breaker, this is a case of the creators deciding, hey, we don't want Hasbro to own the rights to this character, so let's premiere them somewhere else first and then have them in Transformers. Death's Head is a robotic freelance peacekeeping agent, aka a bounty hunter, which is odd that that's his descriptor that he keeps correcting for bounty hunter, since that sounds more like a mercenary to me. I'd flourish up a bounty hunter as hazardous individual tracking and capture specialist. Anyway, as I've explained in the past, Death's Head is basically the bridge between Marvel, Transformers, and Doctor Who of all things, because he's appeared in all of them in their various comic continuities, to not much success, unfortunately, in one way or another. But even the TF Wiki page for him is written as if Death's Head himself wrote it, which was admittedly kind of frustrating when doing some research for this intro, but still a lot more pleasant experience than the fan wikias that are sadly inundated with obtrusive ads. Let's dig into Transformers UK number 132 to 134 and see what we've got. To be clear, I'm not covering every story in these issues. As I said, these issues were anthologies, and they either cover material that we've already looked at, in this case, the first issue of the Headmasters miniseries, or just unrelated stories outside what the patron asked me to do. On that note, my scans come from a trade collection of the UK Transformers comics, so no looking at the covers. We begin from issue number 132 with Cup Story. We open in deep space several hundred years ago. Combat fatigue, the medics called it. Then General Patton got really pissed off about it. 
After millions of years in the firing line, you begin to lose your fighting edge. Your timing goes. You start making mistakes. End result, you become a liability to your fellow Autobots. Although, just between you and me, I shot Huffer deliberately, little smartass. These war veterans are put out to pasture, given a spacecraft and allowed to drift through the remaining years alone. The heroic Autobots, who take their old and war-weary and shove them in a spaceship and tell them to piss off. Wow. Like, let them retire from active combat? Let them do strategy, planning, and support work instead of direct fighting? Pfft, nah. We just happen to have a lot of small spacecraft we can toss out into space when we don't want to give them a retirement package. Jeez. He says that there's no cure for this. Sometimes a war veteran can regain what they lost, but only the very strong-willed. Cup narrates to us his story. How he was once one of the best Autobots in the war, but eventually he got sloppy. Battles began to blur into one another. Just ceaseless combat, day in, day out. Car wash of doom? Indistinguishable from the time we fought the Space Circus or when Optimus Prime fought in a video game. It seems this exile is one he self-imposed on himself rather than risk the lives of the other Autobots. Drifting through space from one dead-end planet to the next, seeking nothing and finding less. I was so bored I ate some old ketchup packets the other day. Honestly, it wasn't an unpleasant experience. He starts to toast the end of his existence, when all of a sudden, the ship is lurched around. He spots two larger, weird-looking vessels shooting at a smaller one near him. You know, when I was a little kid, I used to take pipe cleaners and twist them around each other in sections to create little weird spaceships made out of tubes. That's what these alien ships remind me of. Anyway, Cup can tell that the larger vessels are just toying with the smaller ones, screwing with them before they go for the killing blow. It pisses him off since it reminds him of Decepticon tactics and wants to intervene, but stops himself. What am I saying? Once I might have been able to help him, but not now. I'd probably miss and end up shooting him out of the sky myself. Don't be ridiculous, Cup. You'll just accidentally shoot yourself instead. He soon comes around, though, and blasts the ships. And for a moment, it seemed as though I'd never really been away. But only for a moment. Turns out there was a fuel leak inside the ship, and I was hallucinating all this. With the ships vanquished, fear and revulsion swept over Cup, reminding him of when, back on Cybertron, he couldn't pick up a gun without almost fainting. Still, the pilot of the other craft thanks him for the rescue and asks to come aboard since his own ship is breaking up. Company was the last thing I wanted, but what option did I have? Having gone to the trouble of saving him, I could hardly let him perish with his craft. Plus, we needed to exchange insurance information. Also, apparently the ship has transporter technology, since he beams over the occupant of the ship, and it's Hot Rod! Hey, I don't believe it! You're an Autobot, just like me! Space is really big! There's more room for coincidences that way! This is, in the Marvel Comics continuity, the first meeting between the two of them. Hot Rod explains that he and Blur were on a scouting mission for Fortress Maximus looking for inhabitable worlds, again, tying into the Headmaster stuff, when they came across a race called the Tyroxians. The two were captured, but Hot Rod managed to escape and is trying to get reinforcements to rescue Blur. However, he thinks that with Cup's help they can do it, but Cup refuses because of his retirement, saying that he's taken him back to Cybertron. In the cockpit, Cup thinks about how hot-headed the guy is, but kind of reminds him of someone he used to know and respect, but it turns out Hot Rod messed with the navigational controls and sends them to Tyroxia. He then stole a landing pod to go get Blur by himself. Couldn't you have just flown down and beamed him up? This is why you don't establish you have teleportation technology. While Hot Rod begins his rescue operation, Cup realizes who the kid reminds him of. Himself. At one time, I'd have been there, living life on a knife edge, fighting against impossible odds in the name of the Autobots. You know, trying to do something incredibly stupid. Cup declares that he wants that kind of life for himself back, and even if there's no cure for combat fatigue, Hot Rod is probably relying on him to come and save his life when things inevitably go wrong. And indeed, Hot Rod, after having retrieved Blur, is currently getting his ass kicked by a Tyroxian. All of the fight seems to have gone out of you. I weary of this game. Autobots, I have developed combat fatigue and must now go into exile. Good luck with everything. A caption box informs us that this is being translated from Tyroxian, a fact that saves this comic, since otherwise that minor insignificant plot hole that I wouldn't have even thought of would have ruined it. Anyway, cup to the rescue, shooting the Tyroxian back. You thought I was beaten, didn't you? Thought I was just a washed up old has-been. You told me only a strong-willed person could make it back. I feel like I'm missing 
bring some context here, Autobot! And so the story ends with the three returning to Cybertron, Hot Rod poking fun at Cup's whole retirement. After all, we have you pensioners getting in the way. Little known Transformers detail? Autobots have pension plans. That leads us into issue 133 and the two-parter that's our main focus, Headhunt. We begin on the planet Scarvix in the year 2007. Somewhere, an idiot decides to start writing text reviews of awful comic books and all the horrors that follow from such a choice. A Decepticon named Blot is talking to Death's Head, pissed that he's not seeking revenge on Rodimus Prime for their previous encounter. Apparently Rodimus cheated him out of money owed for killing Galvatron, and then had to go running when confronted by a ton of Autobots. The Decepticons, in turn, got a bunch of info for him for how he could take revenge on Rodimus, but he's not interested. We offer you revenge! And where's the profit in that, eh? Revenge may be satisfying on one level, but it doesn't pay the rent, right? And this is why bounty hunting can be such a rewarding profession. You can potentially get revenge and be paid for it! He tells Blot to make him an offer and they'll talk. Ha! I'd heard you mercenaries were as stubborn if you were as well informed as you thought. You know I don't like being called a mercenary! Okay, but in his defense, I did the research on you, and everything said you hated being called a bounty hunter. That's why I made that joke about mercenaries at the start. The jobs can overlap, but they are different. But yeah, Blot agrees to pay him, and Death's Head is pleased. Now you're talking a language Death's Head understands! Esperanto! Rodimus Prime is as good as dead, yes? I mean, you're the freelance peacekeeping agent, shouldn't you know? A week later on Cybertron, we see Rodimus being contacted about making a tour of their trench fortifications, to his annoyance. He thinks everything is as secure as it's gonna be, and a tour won't change that. I should be out there fighting a war that's dragged on for far too long as it is. That's if you can really call it a war anymore. With both sides so evenly matched, the Autobots' conflict with the evil Decepticons has become little more than guerrilla warfare. Scattered, messy engagements with the enemy, and no end in sight. See, this is why you're not as good a leader as Optimus, dude. Considering historically the Autobots have been in a desperate struggle to survive, the war being reduced to a few minor skirmishes means less death and less old Autobots getting exiled into space. At this rate, the war could drag on for another four million years. If this stalemate doesn't end soon, I swear I'll crack up. Which makes it sound more like you're bored, dude. I can't help yearning for simpler times. When I was just Hot Rod, war was a game. One to be played and enjoyed. You're kind of an idiot, aren't you? Since this is based on the Marvel Comics continuity, mixed with a bit of the TV continuity, he also recalls how he used to be a Target Master, with a Nebulon who transformed into a gun for him to use. And I enjoyed a fresh, new style of combat. I don't know if I would call shooting a gun slightly better than a regular gun that much of a new style, dude. Said Target Master is dead now, but Rodimus stops reminiscing so he can focus on his actual job. We cut over to another part of Cybertron, where the Decepticons are holed up. Cyclonus and Scourge, Galvatron's former lieutenants, are pissed that Shockwave, and now the de facto leader of the Decepticons since Galvatron was sent back in time in the Marvel continuity, hired Death's Head to deal with Rodimus. Apparently he kicked the crap out of them the last time, and they don't take kindly to that. You seem to think that because you were created by the planet devourer Unicron, you are in some way superior to your fellow Decepticons, including me! Now, if it was Soundwave we were talking about, then it'd be true. Soundwave superior. The two say they'll deal with Rodimus themselves and storm out, proclaiming that they'll rule the Decepticons once they've delivered Prime's head. Shockwave just laughs at this. Shockwave may not have a face, but he's got a smile in his heart. During his tour, Rodimus suddenly feels very paranoid and uneasy, which is soon proven right when his fellow Autobots are stealthily beheaded by Death's head. I'm disappointed, yes? Uh, no, you're not! Got you there. Hoped you'd be a more elusive prey. But no, you surround yourself with weak, ineffectual warriors. Dispatched in no time, they were. Then, like some amateur, you allow yourself to be panicked. Left wide open for attack, yes? Why aren't you being paranoid at every single moment of your existence? Which is certainly a sign of calm and not of panic at all, yes? Before Death's Head can deliver the killing blow, however, the ground gives way beneath the two and they fall down into some kind of sewage line. Rodimus vanishes into the... Water? Oil? Whatever it is. Lost Axe. Pity. 
Great sentimental value attached. Plus, it'll cost me like another 800 bucks to get one on Space eBay. Sucks, yes. Despite Rodimus vanishing a second ago, he's suddenly back a few feet from Death's Head, who equips a titanium shot blaster in place of his axe. No hard feelings, Prime. For what it's worth, this is just business, yes? You can tell by the very neutral expression on my face that this isn't personal at all, yes? A few short hours ago, Rodimus Prime could not see an end to the war that is his life. Right at this moment, however, an end is all he can see. Without Rodimus Prime, a lasting peace accord between the Autobots and Decepticons was finally reached. A Chakum ends this part, bringing us to part two of Headhunt, and the last story we'll look at today in issue 134. Cybertron, Earth Date 2007. The first live-action Transformers movie is released. Hell comes with it. It's revealed that Death's Head was the one who got shot instead of Rodimus, Scourge having shot him to prevent him from getting the kill. Cyclonus berates him for not waiting until after he shot Rodimus. Listen, you weren't the one Death's Head once blew a big hole in! He doesn't want to say it out loud, but what he means by that is that Death's Head broke his heart. However, their argument provides enough of a distraction for Rodimus to escape. As the two go after him, Death's Head begins to rise up. Oh, great. Death's Head 2 wasn't supposed to happen for another five years. Rodimus isn't doing too hot, struggling to go on. He thinks to himself that he felt a little bit of relief when Death's Head was about to kill him and wonders if he should give in to the inevitable. I'm tired. So very tired of this endless war. Last time, it wasn't the war you were tired by. You were tired by the lack of war going on. But if I die, what then? Mm -hmm. Arise, Grim Lockamus Prime. Scourge and Cyclonus, having only half a brain cell between the two of them, shoot down a random corridor when they think they hear something, and of course find nothing. Rodimus waits for them to pass, having gone into a waste vent or something. Ugh, not the healthiest of hiding places, but at least I'm still alive. Ugh, probably not for much longer given the amount of sewage you took in. He realizes that he can't just give up. I can't just lay down and die, not while I carry the creation matrix, the Autobots' sacred life force within me. I am perhaps the only one who can stop the Decepticons. I have to live! Eh, he says that, but give it five minutes and somehow Optimus will be back to life. Rodimus doubled back to where Death's Head fell, hoping to find a weapon, but he only finds his shield. Speaking of, Death's Head is caught up to Cyclonus and Scourge. Sloppy! Should have checked, eh? Made sure! Shield took the blast, yes. Impact just stunned me. You'd think these two of all Transformers, who were reformatted from others left for dead, would have learned to double tap. As he fires on them, they make a run for it, right into Rodimus, who discovers a red letter A on the wall. That wall is an adulterer? The two Decepticons run past Rodimus, more concerned with their own lives, and Rodimus Captain America's the shield right into the bounty hunter to slow him down. Rodimus quickly finishes a ladder leading to the surface, Death's Head following right into the Autobots' main base, where several of our heroes now aim guns at him. The A was apparently a marker they used to chart when they wanted to leave the base undetected. I'm not sure how that works. Death's Head realizes he's beaten and is willing to call off the bounty, but Rodimus has a counter-proposal. Since they've both got scores to settle with Cyclonus and Scourge now, here's 10,000 bucks in advance to bring him their heads. Our hero, everybody, hires an assassin to kill his enemies! And so our story ends with Death's Head accepting, thinking that maybe this was all actually a plot by Shockwave to bring about this very thing because of his problems with Cyclonus and Scourge. Which... I guess is possible, but since he's in charge, couldn't he just, like, order his other troops to kill them? Megatron did that kind of thing all the time. Anyway, these stories are overall good. The Cup story is a bit goofy because of the idea that they just send old Transformers with PTSD into space to deal with their issues, especially as a thing the good guys do. But as a first story where Cup and Hot Rod meet, it's pretty decent. Seeing something of himself in Hot Rod goes a long way to explain why he seems to mentor Hot Rod, even if he's annoyed by him at times. The Death's Head two-parter is good, mostly action-oriented. While the character development for Rodimus isn't unwelcome, the problem with the character is that it was often his only story beat. His inexperience and 
and self-doubt. Sure, the idea in the cartoon where he was building up to be as great a leader as Optimus, but in the comic he's been leader for two years now and is still having the same issues as if this was his first month on the job? Eh, a little iffy, especially when he's complaining about there not being enough open war between the two sides. Still not bad, and despite my joking, there is an elegance to just paying the guy who came after you to instead go after your enemy. Next time, we return to the land of Stan Lee's vision of the DC Universe. We've seen him tackle Batman, but what about Robin? Did you hear that? No, Commander. What was it? I... No, it was probably nothing. Just my imagination. I'm the Ninja Consultant for the Decepticons. Hello, my friends. Please take a moment to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and click the bell for notifications on new video releases. If you'd like to support future videos, you can check out my Patreon or purchase a t-shirt via Teespring or Shark Robot. Thanks for watching!